the enjoyments of his rights very unsecure. It was for this reason that individuals agreed to form a community for the mutual preservation of their lives, liberties, and estates, which Locke comprehensively termed property. Under this compact, each individual gives up their natural power to act for his own preservation, to be regulated by the laws made by society. In short, according to Locke, the end of government is to direct the force of the subjects of the Commonwealth for the purpose of pre preserving the members of the Commonwealth as a whole from peace and injury and violence. The impact of this is clear. Because governments must protect their citizens as a Commonwealth, certain liberties must be surrendered by the individual to achieve maximum utility and happiness. In the case of public health emergencies, limiting liberties to keep people safe is not new. Governments have historically imposed restrictions to keep their citizenry safe. For example, secondhand smoke laws, speed limits, TSA bag checks, and many more. It is not beyond the bounds of good government to take necessary action to keep their constituents safe in regard to limiting civil liberties. Contention three, international security. As a member of the international community, states have an obligation not just to themselves, but to the global community. Borderless public health emergencies require widespread action to limit the severity of said emergency. In a review of 29 studies, Greppen and Kelly Lee, a researcher who studies global health at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada, found that most models show that travel restrictions and border closures reduce the arrival of people with COVID-19 in many countries early in the outbreak. This means that because border closures through a violation of personal civil liberty yield net positive benefits for the global community, they must be justified. In regard to the COVID-19 pandemic, it has shown public health researchers that in some situations, travel restrictions help keep epidemics under control. The general feeling before was that they don't work at all and undermine human rights until studies began to reveal the effect. One effect on the ban of people leaving the Chinese city of Wuhan where the pandemic started found that it prevented nearly 80% of COVID-19 infections from spreading to countries outside of China in the weeks after it was imposed. The impact of this is clear because it is the obligation of the government to provide safety, not just for their internal community, but for the global community as well. Violations of civil liberties can be justified to uphold governmental obligations. It is because the government must protect our individual liberty, national security and international security I see no other ballot than affirmative. All right, I'm ready to jump into cross if everyone else is ready. Okay, um, I'll take that as a yes. And then with that, that's three minutes we can begin now. Okay, so firstly, I'd like to talk about framework. So on the value of justice, how do you define justice? Give each their due. Okay, so everyone has to have their dues for justice to be achieved. Sure. So how is, let's say we fulfill the criterion. Is the only thing people do liberty? No, people are due uh, all of their natural rights, life, liberty, property. Okay, so then how does the value criterion of just restrictions on liberty actually uphold justice as a whole in all dues that people are supposed to be entitled to under your definition of justice? Okay, sure, because what we're saying is on the negation, when we don't have violations of civil liberties, we see like direct violations of those three most basic- Well, rights. I'm not talking about the negation. Like, let's just look at your framework in a vacuum, like outside of the context of like the actual contentions, right? How are we achieving justice and making sure everyone has their dues if we're only restricting liberty? Okay, I don't necessarily see the topicality of the question when we look at it completely like completely removed from the contention level. Like the criterion exists to like evaluate contention level arguments, so I don't necessarily like understand why like Well, I mean, it's framework. It's why your philosophical reasoning for this round is justified. So, can you tell me why just restrictions on liberty is the way we achieve all of our dues in a society? Sure, because when we have just restrictions on liberty, we can make sure that we're not like in a state of nature, in a state of anarchy. How does that ensure like other dues other than like liberty? Okay, are you asking, I don't necessarily think I understand your question. What we advocate for is that we have to violate certain liberties to keep people safe. That's why we have like speed limits, TSA bag checks, like all of those types of things, mask mandates, like border. Okay, border. this is getting a little circular, so we can move on. So when you're talking about personal security, right, is the only evidence you read within this contention US specific? Uh, the evidence, though, maybe U.S. specific, it's like one of the most widely accepted concepts about like the idea of like constitutional democracies. So, OK, so if it's just U.S. specific, why does this affirm as a general principle? OK, I have a couple issues with what you're saying. I would say first, it's not just U.S. specific because it's like a widely accepted political theory that like when people infringe against our rights, the government is obligated to step in. I mean, that's the purpose of a government. But secondly, I think that when we like take this out of context and say like it's just a U.S. specific evidence, we're still ignoring the argument. Like you have to like disagree with the argument itself rather than just like where it's from. OK, but you're telling me just because the Supreme Court said like mandatory vaccinations are just that mandatory vaccinations are just. 
So yeah. can actually can you actually explain the warranting as to like why it doesn't matter that this is U.S. specific? No, sure. Yeah, because like basically like what like what I've said a couple times is that it's like one of the most widely accepted political theories. When people are actively infringing against our rights, that's why we have a government to keep us safe, to keep people from infringing upon our rights. If that's what you disagree with, then that has nothing to do with the Supreme Court case. Okay. Is it just to take a coercive action if there's a less coercive alternative? Okay. Can you repeat the question? Is it just for a government to take the most coercive action if there's a way to achieve the same end without using coercion? Okay, I think if you're relating this to topicality, which seems to be what you're doing, I think the question is- No, more just answer the question. <laughs> it's well, not like specific, I'm not trying to trap you. I just wanna know like how you think about this. Okay, then repeat the question. Um, that's about cross, is it okay if I repeat the question or do we wanna move on? Okay, so I'll take that as a yes. Is it just for a government to use the most coercive action if there's a less coercive alternative? I would say in regard to every situation, no. Okay, um, with that, I'll run some prep before the end. Okay, um, that is all the prep we'll need to take. 
nothing crazy for any order, just NC and then responding to the affirmative case. Are all of my judges and my opponent ready? Okay. Perfect. So with that, uh, that seven minutes, I'll begin now. I negate resolved. A public health emergency justifies limiting civil liberties. I value justice defined as giving each their due, but to support this, look to the value criterion of maximizing societal welfare. Societal welfare encompasses all the dues the government is obligated to provide, including rights, health, and order. Importantly, in order to fully maximize societal welfare, governments need to maintain public trust, as public trust is empirically related back to quality of government performance and has deep social implications. I have one observation. It is necessary for governments to take the least restrictive actions to protect societal welfare because individual rights are the basis of legitimate government. The affirmative must prove that restricting civil liberties is the only way to address a public health emergency as ignoring a less restrictive alternative would not be justified. The thesis of the negative is that limiting civil liberties in the face of a public health emergency unnecessarily restricts rights and undermines the public trust essential for mitigation efforts. My first contention is voluntary compliance, and the subpoint A is control aversion. When states utilize coercive action to move the populace towards anti-COVID measures, results are often counterproductive. A study by Schmelz 21 explains that enforced anti-COVID mandates lead to a negative response and compliance termed control aversion, a psychological response to coercive action. Simply put, when someone tries to control their decisions, many people tend to act against the control. Schmelz's study places this psychological response in the context of COVID-19, finding that compliance rates for virus preventing measures such as social distancing and contract tracing were always either higher than or identical to compliance rates for enforced measures. Bowles et al. 21 reinforces these findings examining vaccination uptake. The authors observe increased opposition to vaccinations that are legally required, while in contrast for voluntary vaccinations, there was higher and undiminished support. My subpoint B talks about communication. Effective communication on part of the government can eliminate the necessity of coercive measures. Reflecting on the SARS outbreak, Rug et al. 09 reports that implementation of virus preventing behavior essential for preventing spread of disease was largely dependent on effective risk communication, not government mandates. Effective risk communication that induces realistic risk perceptions, correct knowledge and skills to promote and enable precautionary practices provides the public with both the urgency to engage in voluntary measures and the tools to do so. Watanabe and Yabu 20 analyzed Japan's voluntary lockdown system during the COVID pandemic and linked public compliance with lockdowns overwhelmingly to citizens obtaining new information through government updates. Thus, what is necessary to contain the spread of public health emergencies is not strong legally binding measures, but the provision of appropriate information that encourages people to change their behavior. My second contention is power expansion. Public health emergencies uniquely create opportunities for expansion and abuse of government power. As reinforced by Freedom House 20, the guise of health crises allows governments worldwide to expand power outside what is proportionate to the crisis. Empirically, states use expansion of emergency powers beyond what is necessary, increasing rights violations and accelerating autocratization by 75%, according to Lerman and Rooney 20. This expansion of power erodes public trust in two key ways. The first is privacy violations. According to NA20, governments across the world have launched intrusive surveillance measures in the name of monitoring the spread of the COVID-19 virus. The second is censorship. In accordance with the findings of Shabazz 20 and Sherman 20, overreach of government censorship powers have been widely deployed against truthful information in real investigative reporting, severely curbing the freedom of expression. The impact is erosion of public trust. Zhu and Kiyoma of Northwestern University empirically proved political repression has a permanent negative impact on trust among both communities and the government. Wu 21 finds that globally areas with higher social cohesion and trust have increased participation in social distancing, fewer confirmed COVID-19 cases, deaths, and slower infection growth rates. Thus, I negate and will now move on to the affirmative case. So firstly, my opponent reads you this observation saying that the affirmative doesn't have to prove restricting civil liberties is justified in every single scenario. She just has to do so on principle. And I agree with this observation. She has to do so on principle. So remember when she uses super US specific definition, it's her own burden that she sets herself that she affirms on principle. On the value of justice, we conflate here, but look to the value criterion of just restrictions on liberty. Here's my response to this. There's a few problems here. Firstly, she tells you in cross-examination that, um, that like dues, justice as we both define it as to each their due. So people need to have all their dues for the government to be considered just. 
Her value criterion, however, doesn't actually uphold this conception of justice. Let's say we've completely achieved the value criterion. We have just restrictions on liberty. That doesn't mean that everyone is going to have their dues, such as life, liberty, property. That just means that we've justly restricted liberty in some circumstances. People have dues outside of liberty, such as life and property, like my opponent points out in her, their own case. So with that, their framework doesn't actually work here. Restrictions on liberties don't actually ensure dues. Uh, the framework doesn't work for, for justice defined by achieving societal welfare. Moving on to the first contention, talking about personal security, a few problems with this. Firstly, all of the examples she gives you where like restrictions are justified come from US interpretations. Make my opponent prove to you on principle that public health emergencies always follow this trend. But secondly, philosophically and pragmatically, I still outweigh here. So firstly, look to my observation. I agree with most of my, what my opponent is saying in this contention, but look to my observation. She has to prove to you that she is taking the least coercive alternative or that restricting civil liberties are the only way to solve a public health emergency. Otherwise, it wouldn't be justified to do so. So on a philosophical level, it's not just to restrict civil liberties during public health emergencies, because I show you through my first contention that there are less restrictive alternatives. So philosophically, it's not justified. But second, pragmatically, it's not justified because you risk power abuse if you give the government the ability to... Um, limit rights. Within this point, my opponent talks about how orders are bad and that we can limit the power of government, but NSO8 tells you that if you use public health emergencies as a justification for restricting liberties, this will become an endless cycle because there will always be a new threat, a new pandemic, a new virus, so it becomes an indefinite cycle of restrictions on liberties. Moving on, the second contention doesn't really make any new grounds that the personal liberty contention doesn't. So you can cross apply pretty much the same arguments I make on the first contention to this point on national security. But second, look to the point that authoritarian regimes compromise national security even more. Um, so you can cross apply my second contention in that way here. But thirdly, let's look at one of the biggest points of contention, which is going to be my opponent's third contention on international security. They talk about how travel restrictions and certain COVID restrictions are really effective. A few responses here. Firstly, extend Schmelz 21 and Valve 21. My opponent hasn't proven why these restrictions have to be mandatory. And Schmelz 21 specifically tells you that voluntary measures had higher than or identical to compliance rates. And then you can extend Ben David 21, a card from Stanford University that empirically found no relationship in an analysis of nine different countries found no relationship between the strictness of lockdown measures and the number of cases. So this is showing you mandatory measures like my opponent is advocating for aren't necessary. But lastly, look to the card 21 that tells you that was no, that um, compliance with bias preventing behaviors were dependent upon trust in government and science, not actual mandate. So science works with my sub point B. For all of those reasons, I strongly negate. Okay, is everybody ready for cross? All right, then let's begin. All right, on your criterion about maximizing societal welfare, how do we maximize societal welfare? Yeah, so to maximize societal welfare, you encompass all due the government is obligated to provide. So when the government is providing like your most fundamental dues, including life, health, order, things like that. Okay, and it, are governments in any scenario justified in limiting civil liberties? I would say specifically in a public health emergency, you have to prove that the only way to solve this is going to be restricting civil liberties. And I argue that absolutely in a public health emergency, the only option is absolutely not restricting civil liberties because I show you through like voluntary compliance and effective communication, you achieve the exact same results as you do with coercive measures, if not higher. Okay, why is it an either or for the affirmative? Why does it have to be coercive measures through mandatory things or voluntary? What do you mean in either or? Like if you're not like, like why you have to do something, then it's a voluntary measure. You can't do both. Like you can't have voluntary and involuntary mandates. How? Why can't you have like a voluntary mask mandate and an involuntary border closure? Well, firstly, I would say like a mask mandate isn't a restriction on your civil liberty. Like nowhere in the constitution does that like be protected. But in addition to that, I show you that specifically Schmelz 21, if you want to talk about mandates, looks at mask mandates and finds that compliance rates for that are higher than or identical to enforced measures. So there's no reason to use coercive action in the first place. The reason why it's an either or is to my second mention in which I show you, if we give the government the ability to restrict our civil liberties, it becomes, uh, they use it in order to use like perpetuate political repression. So that's why it's an either or. Okay, let's talk about political repression. Why in regard to public health emergencies when governments create laws, are they more subject to political repression than they, when they just create like regular laws? Yeah, so specifically, I would say like the political and social climates when governments are creating laws during a public health emergency are much easier to like expand government powers. And we've seen this historically, like 
public health emergencies and states of emergencies have empirically been proven to be times when rights are accelerated. I read you the Lerman and Rooney 20 card in which we've seen autocorization increase by 75% during the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's empirics right there proving that point. So what if governments are just making regular laws as the course of a government would do that just so happens to be made in public health emergency? Are those laws also subject to repression? Yeah, so specifically, I told you public health emergencies create this unique political environment in which we see a populace is concerned with other things than government accountability. Obviously, there's a pandemic going on. There's a lot of economic impacts. The, the economic like infeasibility yeah. of pandemics like cool. helps autocrats seize power. You can see that in like the 1940s. We okay. saw that. Sure. Then would you advocate that government should shut down during public health emergencies to ensure no backsliding? Well, no, because I tell you specifically, if we give the government the power to restrict civil liberties, then like, and we see government shutdowns and things like that, they're just going to use this to accelerate rights violations. I don't see how that would be a solution to anything. I'm saying government should play an active role in mitigating pandemics and using like via voluntary, like social distancing, mask mandates, things like that. Okay, that's about time. So I'll go ahead and take prep starting now. Okay. The order is just going to be uh, negative affirmative. Is everybody ready? All right, then let's begin. On the value of justice, we both agree, but the affirmative upholds it better because the criterion level debate, we win. On the criterion about maximizing societal welfare, I have one main response to this. I said that life is a prerequisite to anything that, this, that societal welfare can actually uphold. And because we're the only side that actually saves lives and keep people safe by upholding governmental obligation, we're the only side that can achieve this. When people are dead, they don't have rights. On the observation about least restrictive action, my opponent completely misunderstands the entire affirmative thesis, which she agrees to. She agrees to our observation, which simply says it's a tool in the toolbox. We're not going to be violating civil liberties every single time there's a public health emergency. We're just saying that if there's a public health emergency and the government wants to ask someone to wear a mask or not travel to France, that the government is all, that, the, that the government is able to do so. So sure, we can still take the least restrictive action. That doesn't mean that we get rid of every other action. Now, on the connection one about voluntary measures, she says first on the sub point A about control aversion, that things like vax, that when we force people to get vaccinated or when we force people to do things, they're all, like, they, they automatically have an aversion to that, but then gives us no uniqueness why they don't have an aversion to every other law. Just because people like are don't like authority doesn't mean that we're no longer allowed to create laws because people aren't going to agree with them or aren't going to like them. We still have to create laws. We still have to create regulations because those things are still important, whether or not people like them. Further on the sub point B about communication, she talked a lot about SARS and how communication works better and about Japan lockdowns being voluntary and how all of those things ended up working better. I don't think that these things are mutually exclusive to the affirmative, to the negative. We can have both of these things. We can have things like voluntary mask mandates or voluntary vaccine mandates and then non-voluntary um, like travel restrictions. We don't have to have just one or the other. My opponent doesn't say why we can't have increased communication and things like mask mandates. She doesn't give you an either or. She has to be able to prove to you why these things can't exist at the same time. Further, on the convention too about power expansion, a couple of responses. She says first that governments are going beyond what is necessary when they have like these violations of civil liberties. But again, no uniqueness why these are any different from other laws. Why don't they do this when they ask you to wear a seatbelt? Why don't they do this when they ask you to stop smoking in public? She has to give some sort of uniqueness for you to be able to vote on this judge. Even further, she talks about censorship and surveillance. But I think that every law has the, like, has the ability to be abused, but that doesn't mean that we don't create law. She says that, that the governments are abusing this. Authoritarian regimes are very bad and they can violate civil liberties. But that doesn't mean that we never violate civil liberties ever, ever again, just because they might be abused. She has to outweigh on some sort of magnitude, which she doesn't at this point in the round. Further, she talks about public trust and about how public trust increases when governments are looser on restrictions. But I would say that there's a turn on this. When governments do nothing, that's when people lose trust in their government because the literal purpose of the government is to protect our security. And they do so by creating laws, by violating our civil liberty. When the government does nothing, that's when people lose trust the most. On 
on to the affirmative. The value of justice, we still win because of the criterion debate. On just restrictions of liberty, she says one, that justice can't be provided through things like just restrictions on liberty, but I think she misunderstands. What we're saying is that we ensure safety from the neg, that we ensure that all of the problems that the neg brings up, we ensure that those rights are kept safe because we allow you a metric on when the government is justified in restricting liberties and when they're not. Simply what the resolution is asking us to do, that's why it's the most preferable. The contention one about personal security, she says one, it's US specific, but this has nothing to do with the actual, the actual argument that's being made. She doesn't disagree with the argument at all. She just agrees that the Supreme Court said it. So pretend the Supreme Court didn't say it. The argument is still there. Further, she says that we have to use least coercive method. This completely ignores the observation about using a tool in the toolbox. Further, she goes on to talk about power abuse. Once again, this is non-unique. Crossed by what we already said, any law is subject to power abuse. Further, she says that there are going to be new pandemics time and time again. But then I think that this, this whole idea about the political climate always being bad in pandemics just has to flow out of the round, Judge, because does that mean the government just can't create laws when the political climate is tight? Further, she never addresses the idea that we've had quarantines for a long time, that why now are they just suddenly becoming unjust? Further, on the contention too about national security, she talks about authoritarian regimes again. Judge, authoritarian regimes were authoritarian before the pandemic, after the pandemic, during the pandemic, it doesn't matter. They're not using a public health emergency to justify their civil liberty violations. They're just having civil liberty violations that go unjust. Further, on the contention three about international security, she says, why mandatory? I read you a card from Columbia University that says that the US could have prevented 36,000 deaths by May 3rd, a week earlier, um, a social distancing could have been done sooner. That's why mandate, because when we mandate, we see those types of benefits. You always vote on those benefits because they're empirical, thus you must vote half. Okay, um, I'll run my remaining prep time. Okay, that's about that. So the order for the NR is going to be firstly starting on framework, moving on to the negative side of the flow, the affirmative, and then giving some key voting issues for today's round. Is everyone ready? Okay, we've got about six minutes and I'll begin now. Firstly, let's look at framing today's round. So on this value criterion of societal welfare, my opponent only gives you one response in that life is it a prerequisite. I value life under this framework. We also value a lot of other dues that people have. Remember, my opponent's framework doesn't give you any other due that actually ensures justice. We only say that there's going to be just restrictions on liberty, but in order to actually uphold justice, as we both define it, people must have all of their dues. Societal welfare ensures that people have all of their dues. In addition to life, we're also protecting liberty and autonomy. My opponent is just protecting liberty. This doesn't even ensure life in a lot of circumstances. On the observation, um, my opponent on the negative side of the flow on my observation basically just says that it's a tool in a toolbox. So she misses the point with this observation. I'm saying, like, she says it's a tool in a toolbox, so the government should be able to use it. But then remember, judges, she concedes in cross that the, it's not going to be justified to use a more restrictive and more coercive option if a less coercive, less restrictive alternative exists. She concedes that it's not just. So my opponent has to prove with this tool in the toolbox arguments that restricting civil liberties is the only way to solve this. It's the only tool that the government should be able to use. She doesn't respond to the heart of this observation. So this stands in today's round. Make my opponent prove that restricting civil liberties is the only way to solve public health emergencies. On the first contention of the negative case, I read on my sub point A talking about control aversion and my opponent drops every single card and only responds saying that this is non-unique. Why don't people have aversions to every single law? So firstly, I would say most laws have been normalized in society. Like the laws, like 
around society that we've had, you've pretty much grown up around. So you've been normalized. The psychological response doesn't actually respond here. When you're introducing new restrictions on civil liberties, which are often highly invasive, as my second contention tells you, restrictions on privacy and censorship, freedom of expression, you're much like more likely to see an adverse response here, especially considering the social and political climates of pandemics. But then she drops all of the cards of this argument. She has no actual card on this response. She has no evidence telling you that this isn't true. She has no evidence here, but look to my two cards that she drops that are super important. Firstly is Schmelz 21 that tells you that for a lot of different COVID-19 restrictions, things like travel orders, stay at home orders, mask mandates, contact tracing, compliance rates were higher than or identical to rates for enforced measures. So you can vote neg just based off of that because I am showing you via my observation that less restrictive alternatives to solve public health emergencies not only exist, but are oftentimes more effective and that is conceded by my opponent. But secondly, she drops bowels at all 21 that specifically tells you examining vaccine, vaccine uptake when vaccines are legally required, people don't want to do that. She doesn't address this card at all. Vaccines are long-term solvency of things like pandemics and public health emergencies. So long-term solvency goes to the negative because mandated vaccinations aren't going to actually work, as this card tells you in my opponent concedes. On this sub, we'd be talking about communication. My opponent's only response is that it's non-unique and that we can't have both. I don't need to prove that you can have both. Per my observation, the only thing I need to prove in order to win this round is that less restrictive alternatives exist because my opponent concedes in cross that it's not just to use a coercive action when an alternative measure that's not coercive exists. She may that concession in cross. Don't forget that, judges. So I don't have to prove that they're both. This isn't non-unique. And specifically, I tell you, in the example of Japan, the only thing they needed was effective communication. There were no, there was no necessity of mandated measures. So you can extend that in today's round and vote neg just off of this drop on subpoint B. But moving on to the second contention on power expansion, my opponent again reads you the same exact response saying that it's non-unique. Why should there be difference for other laws? But I answer this in cross. I tell you that um, specifically pandemics and public health emergencies have unique social and political implications where states are able to expand using emergency power grants. There like rights here. I read you three different cards affirming this. I read you Freedom House 20 and Lerman and Rumi 20 that tells you autocratization increased by 75%. She drops all of these cards and just says it doesn't happen when I'm showing you real world examples of when it did happen. Nay 20, which I read in case, tell you privacy violations have occurred across the globe. It was looking at over 80 different countries and found that these privacy violations all occurred. My opponent just says, well, it doesn't occur. When I'm showing you in the real world, this does happen. Her responses fall and you can vote neg just based off of that. On the point on public trust, she says that government doing nothing harms trust. But again, it's the thesis of the negative case. Not that we do nothing. We should absolutely not do nothing. We should be promoting things like effective communication and voluntary compliance measures, which my opponent cannot prove are not as effective as mandatory measures. So with that, let's move on to the affirmative side of the flow. On the first contention, talking about personal security, I tell you why philosophically and um, pragmatically it's justified. It's uh, limiting, restricting civil liberties is not going to be justified here. Remember this observation. She basically says that she already responded to it, but you can cross apply my responses there. On the second contention, there's really no points of contention here. She's just reiterating the same ideas within the first contention, but on the last contention, talking about national security, one of our biggest points of clash and why the negative wins today's round, she makes some huge drops. So firstly, she drops from Elsa 21, which specifically tell you voluntary measures are even more effective. She reads you a card from Columbia saying the US could have prevented if they started sooner. So firstly, this isn't a problem with voluntary measures. This is a problem with communication. If the government had communicated that you need to be engaging in these practices more quickly, then we wouldn't have this happen. This isn't a problem with non-mandatory. Make my opponent prove that mandatory is required because she hasn't read you a single card with that uniqueness in this entire case. But secondly, she drops Ben David 21, an analysis from Stanford University analyzing 10 different countries that found no correlation between strictness of measures and um, number of cases. So specifically, this was a huge drop in today's round. So the reasons why you vote negative, let's go into key voting issues. The main reason you vote negative is because I best uphold justice on my side of the law through protecting human lives. Remember, my opponent can seize and cross an examination that it's not just for a government to take the most coercive measure when a lesser one exists. And then she drops all of the cards on my first contention telling you that voluntary compliance has even higher rates for both vaccinations and that, and communication on its own is enough to change people's behavior. So for all of these reasons, I strongly negate. Okay, I'll take about 30 seconds of credit. 
Okay. The order is going to just be voting issues. So, is everybody ready? Awesome. Let's begin. The first reason that you vote affirmative is because when you do, you see that the government can have a tool in the toolbox that is violating civil liberties. My opponent tries to convince you in her last speech that we can't have this framework because the idea that was created in cross-examination was that when a less coercive measure is available, it is completely unjust to use any other measure. But judge, I'm telling you that this isn't always true. My opponent tries to take what was said in the abstract in cross-examination and try to apply it to public health emergencies. I tried in cross-examination to tell her that we can't just apply that abstract to public health emergencies. That's because we're like months, almost a year into the, like we're over a year into the pandemic and there are still plenty of people who aren't vaccinated the majority of people are not vaccinated that's because voluntary measures don't always work that's why things like mandatory measures have to be taken into account my opponent tries to convince you that voluntary measures work every single time and sure voluntary measures might work voluntary measures might have benefit they can exist in the in the affirmative world that doesn't mean that just because voluntary measures exist that civil liberty violations can no longer exist like i've told you time and time again that my opponent has yet to address we can have things like voluntary mask mandates but involuntary you know travel restrictions. These things can exist at the same time. My opponent has to prove why there can't be a tool in the toolbox. Sure, governments can do more than one thing at a time. You can't buy this argument. The second reason that you're voting for the affirmative is because the impacts on the negative case simply aren't there. My opponent's case lacks one thing, and that's uniqueness. Almost every single argument she brings up is incredibly non-unique. She talks about things like control aversion that have no uniqueness to public health emergencies. She talks about things like communication and how like, like, uh, like, uh, like voluntary measures work so much better. But again, none of these things have uniqueness to public health emergencies. Same thing with power expansion and democratic backsliding. My opponent has to prove to you why in a public health emergency, violating civil liberties is so much worse than violating civil liberties outside of public health emergency. She tries to convince you that just because we've had laws for a long time, that's why they're different. Well, we have to start somewhere. My opponent has to be able to prove to you why when you go into a grocery store and the government asks you to wear shoes, why that is equally as unjust as when you go into a grocery store and the government asks you to wear a mask. That is what we're advocating for today. My opponent has yet to prove that in today's round. She's just gone a roundabout way of not addressing it. And the third and final reason that you vote for the affirmative is this idea of obligation. What is the government obligated to do? Why did we leave the state, the state of nature? Like, why did we do anything? Why do we have a government? To protect our rights, to keep us safe. And at the point that we are telling the government that they cannot keep us safe, that they cannot use the tools in the toolbox that they might find necessary, that is when we reject our government. That is when we say that they are useless. And at that point, no one, no one's value is upheld. So I say that the only way that we can actually achieve anything in this round is by looking to the framework debate where I tell you when governments are allowed to, to justly restrict our liberty, when our government's allowed to actually do their job, a violation of our civil liberty in the case of public health emergency is one of those times. We have to be willing to accept the government's help to save lives. Like I read you earlier, earlier if the government would have acted just one week sooner with these mandatory mask mandates, 36,000 people could have been saved. That's the result of a government being a government and upholding their obligation. When you vote affirmative, you vote that they have that obligation, that they should be able to use every tool in the toolbox to meet it, and that lives matter. Because of this, I see no other ballot than affirmative. Thank you. Brilliant job, thank you so much. And thank you all for judging. Great round. Yeah, that was a really fantastic round. The best one I've gotten to watch so far. So thank you. Yep. Great round, both of you. And since it was so good, I need a few minutes.
Okay, the decisions are in and it is a 3-0 for the negative. If all the judges could confirm, I did in fact vote negative, everyone else. Yes, I did as well. I voted negative. All right. Congratulations to both debaters. It was an excellent round. It was very hard to decide. Congratulations to the to both of you for being in this deep. We're going to stop the conversation at this point. I'm going to have them stop the live stream, and then I'll let you talk to the kids. I assume they stopped it. I've I've got to go. What I have is on the ballot. But thank you. If either of you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Or yeah, you can you can step out if you're not going to talk to the kids, judges. If you want to, let me just confirm that the stream is stopped before you do that. Okay, we're just waiting on confirmation they've stopped it. 